So I've already had you think a little bit about what life might be like in 2030. But as you start to internalize some of those big changes, it raises some other interesting questions as well. Like, what is this going to mean for the way we work? How will our organizations need to change? What does it take to be successful as a company, as a leader, and as someone who manages teams in the 21st century? These are not easy questions to answer, believe me. I, I've just written a new book called The Algorithmic Leader. And as part of that process, I interviewed many leaders, many like yourselves in big organizations. And I asked them, what are your biggest challenges for the future? What do you think we need to do to be ready to survive and thrive in this new age? Sometimes, and particularly from people who work in big companies, I got an interesting response. Some people said, well, Mike, I, I think we need to behave more like a disruptive startup. Maybe you've heard that as well. It sounds like a good idea, doesn't it? To be more like a agile and disruptive startup until you think about it a little bit. And then, I don't know, it starts to sound like a 50 year old trying to be 18 again, you know, like a corporate midlife crisis. It's funny, I put startup into Google to find a suitable picture to share with all of you. And I just got this really annoying photo of attractive people with perfect teeth. This is a frightening photograph on so many levels. I don't know where they find these stock photography people. I can only imagine that they're robots and not humans. But if you look at this picture, it kind of sums up, doesn't it, some of the fantasies we have about working at a startup. Uh, I don't know what, did these people take some selfies and I don't know, sell themselves to Google after two weeks for a billion dollars? Maybe you've had a fantasy about being in a startup as well. But here's the problem. If you can't be agile and disruptive when there's only four of you, there must be something profoundly wrong with all of you. It's a bit harder when you get, become 40 people or 400 people. I hear there's over 140,000 people at Verizon. So any of you that are nurturing ideas of behaving like a small company, it's going to be tough. And in actual fact, it's not really necessary because scale is often necessary because the world is complex and the world is nuanced and customers have different needs and you need scale sometimes to provide adequate service and solutions to a complex world. So the real question is not, how do you be like a startup? The question is, how do you be like a different kind of company? I mean, who would have thought that a pizza company would be valued as if it was a technology company? And yet Domino's does some crazy things that only a technology company would do. For instance, they use AI and computer vision to scan their pizzas, you know, to see if it's the right temperature and the pepperoni is in exactly the right spot. Seriously, who does this? You know who does this? Domino's does this. I remember I had this conversation with the head of logistics for this big Fortune 50 company. Actually, he was complaining to me. He was saying, Mike, I just don't understand. I've literally spent millions of dollars on IT. And yet still to this day, I don't know where my trucks are with millions of dollars worth of merchandise them at, at all times. Yet how is it that when it comes to ordering a pizza, Domino's seems to know where my $10 pizza is in real time? And I said to him, the reason why this happens is because ultimately spending money on technology is not enough. You can upgrade your entire enterprise technology stack. And all you've done is just change the hardware of your business. If you want to really transform, if you want to become a new type of company, then what you need to do is answer a more difficult question. You have to figure out how do you make culture your operating system? What does this mean to create a cultural operating system? Well, in a sense, all of our interactions with each other, the way we make decisions, the way we collaborate, the way we solve problems, our principles, our values, even the way we use technology. This is a system of interactions. It's just like an operating system. And if you really want to be part of the bigger transformation that's taking place today to become Verizon 2.0, this is where you need to participate. You've got to be thinking, how are these changes going to ultimately influence the way that I do things, the way I lead my team? 
and what I bring to work on a daily basis. You know, it's often the hardest part of emerging technology is trying to figure out how this changes our human organizations, the way we do things. It's not easy. I mean, take electricity. This is something we take for granted, right? But electricity is still a relatively new innovation. It was in 1831 that Michael Faraday invented the electric dynamo. How long do you think it took for people to take that innovation and use it to transform the way we did things, like manufacturing? What do you think? Five years? 10 years? 20 years? Do you know what? It took 82 years for Henry Ford to look at that invention of electricity and go, you know what, maybe we can design the factory in a different way. He came up with the moving assembly line. But until then, essentially, in a big factory, they just took the steam engine out and put the electric motor in. They left the drive shaft, they left all the engineering from the steam industrial age completely unchanged. It took almost 100 years for someone to say, with this innovation, it doesn't just mean about doing something faster or cheaper. It means we can do something differently. But believe me when I tell you, in this algorithmic age, we're not going to have 82 years to try and figure out how data and AI and automation needs to change the way we do things. In fact, we probably won't even have 10 years to do this. So as you start to be hearing about these new innovations and changes in the industry and at work, I want you to be thinking closely about what this means for some of the big levers in your role today. And I'm talking about things like people and process and technology. So let's think about people. What do you think AI and technology is going to do to the kinds of people and capabilities that are going to be very important for the future? What are the kinds of people that are going to thrive in this new environment? This is a difficult one because if you think about it, some of the most valuable people that will be working in your team in the future, will be working right alongside you, will probably have job titles that don't even exist today. So how do you hire people for a role that doesn't exist? In a way, the question is part of the answer because you're going to need to find people that are comfortable with the fact that their job is going to change all the time. And in fact, they're going to have to be people that thrive on uncertainty. You know, this isn't a new idea. Uh, I remember reading that the head of engineering at Airbnb actually looks for people that are, in his words, energized by unknowns. How many people in your team, even yourself, do you really feel are comfortable with ambiguity? When something unpredictable happens, are people excited? Do they see it as a challenge? Or do they see it as a threat to their own personal security and stability? It isn't just about being comfortable with uncertainty though, because one of the most valuable skills and capabilities in the future is to find people that realize that their real job is not to work. Their real job is to design work. In fact, it's their job to find ways to destroy their own job. Let me give an example. There was this kid called Josh Browder. He was from England and he came to America to study. He turned 18, he got a car. Those of you with teenage parents knows how the story ends because what do kids do when they get their first car? Yeah, they have lots of accidents and they have pranks and they get lots of parking fines. Josh got lots of parking fines. I think he almost got like 30 or 40 fines. And his mother was like, listen, I'm not going to pay for your fines. Go get a summer job. He didn't want to get a job. So you know what he did? He stayed up one night in his dorm room and he wrote some code to automate challenging those fines on all of the government websites. Kids. But you know what? It worked. He got to fall the fines and thought to himself, hey, this is great. Other kids could use this. So he decided to release an app. He called it Do Not Pay. In the last 18 months, literally hundreds of thousands of fines, millions of dollars from cities all around the world have been taken back and given to all of the irresponsible teenage drivers in that city. For God's sake, can someone watching this just give this kid a job so we can end this madness? Because seriously, I mean, isn't this exactly the kind of person you'd want working for you? I mean, sure, you can find someone that works hard, 
but how much more valuable if you can find someone that doesn't want to work at all, but will use their skills and knowledge and expertise to essentially reinvent the nature of the work itself. So this is one way of understanding how AI and technology will change work. It doesn't eliminate jobs, but it changes the kinds of people that need to do the work and the mindset that you bring to work. The second thing that's going to be changing in the world around us, of course, is the way we think about process. Re-engineering business processes is a big part of Verizon's new transformation strategy. But when you think about that, you also need to be mindful of the fact that automation is a big lever of change. But it isn't something you should be concerned about. Because when you automate, you also need to be elevating the functions of the human beings involved. There's no point automating a job and just eliminating it. Because what you really want to be doing is asking yourself, this extra time that automation is freeing up, how can we better use that to create more insights or solve problems? I'll tell you an interesting story. When Elon Musk took over the Tesla factory, he didn't actually build it himself. He took it over from Toyota. And the Japanese have long been very good at designing very sophisticated, highly automated factories. But they don't automate everything. Now, Elon Musk, when he took over that factory, thought, I don't know why the Japanese didn't automate everything. So he spent a lot of time and money bringing in high levels of automation. It wasn't long before he realized he made a terrible mistake. Because by automating everything, he actually bizarrely took a lot of the human agility and ingenuity out of the process. Because what the Japanese realized that when you have human beings on an assembly line, they can spot opportunities for transformation, for greater efficiency. They can come up with ideas that can transform the process. When you automate something, you often just lock it in place and you freeze it and you miss the opportunity to come up with new ideas. And actually, as you start to think about how technology changes our work, you realize that it's going to change the decisions we make in lots of different ways. But this is really an opportunity to grow. There are going to be some decisions in your work, and I call them first order decisions, that are obvious cases for automation. Think about your job today. There's probably a bunch of things that are very repetitive. You do them all the time. And this is exactly where in the near future you're going to see automation start to come in. You should welcome this because whether it's provisioning a new customer or ordering new inventory, this is work that probably you and your team have never enjoyed doing and really shouldn't be wasting your time on. But there are going to be other kinds of decisions where in the past you've also been involved, like maybe coming up with the right pricing model or identifying fraud uh, in credit card transactions. This is probably an area where there's massive amounts of data. And the next few years, you're going to see more and more artificial intelligence and machine learning starting to make very interesting recommendations about the right decisions to make. But this is probably an area where human beings will still be very involved. In fact, you yourself may be called upon to work with an automated system. But this is, once again, an interesting opportunity. The machine isn't learning to take your job. In fact, your new job is training the machine to be more effective with time. And this is part of how we're going to bring human understanding and context and experience to improve the systems at the heart of our platform. But there's always going to be higher level problems. I call them third order decisions. These are very tricky, strategic, difficult questions like how do we improve our customer engagement strategy in our retail stores? And the thing is, the more we spend time and resources automating the bottom level decisions, the more time you and your team are going to have to focus on the interesting, meaningful, purpose-driven work that really drives results. The third thing that's going to be critical to the future of transformation in our organization is the role of technology. How should you view technology? Is it a threat? Is it an opportunity? Is it something else? And the message I want to leave with you is that the real value of technology and the investments in technology isn't about saving time and money or being more efficient. I think the real value of technology is something that it produces. Data. What is data, really? 
For me, data is the ultimate weapon essential to changing orthodoxies or long-held opinions. There was an entrepreneur that I really admire. His name was Jim Barksdale. Uh, he was one of the early founders of Netscape, which was the original web browser. He said something that I love. He said, look, if we have data, let's look at the data. If all we have are opinions, let's just go with mine. I'm sure you've encountered this view before. Someone who has a very judgmental view or a long-held opinion. The only way you can get people to do things differently is not to argue with them or tell them that you're right. It's to present data that gives incontrovertible evidence that there is a smarter way of doing things. See, the real value of data isn't about justifying your decisions. It's about finding a new way to make decisions. I'll give an example. This is a friend and colleague of mine. His name is Andy Harris. He's one of the world's most successful TV producers. He's made a bunch of shows I'm sure you might know, like Willander, Outlander. He also made The Crown. Now, The Crown, which is on Netflix today, is a show that almost didn't get made. Because at the time, Andy, who, like I said, was a very successful TV producer, was finding it very hard to get the big US networks to back this show. He went to see everyone and they were like, you know, our people will call your people, which is Hollywood speak for, you know, we're not interested. So eventually, out of desperation, he took a meeting at Netflix. Now, Netflix back then isn't the content giant it is today. So it was kind of a bit of a bet about what they were going to do with this show. Anyway. Andy walks in the meeting. In the meeting is Ted Sarandos, head of content, Reed Hastings, CEO of the company. The minute Andy walks in, Reed stands up and goes, Andy, we love the show. We'll take a whole season. Andy was shocked. He said, don't you want to hear the pitch? I mean, don't you even want to make a pilot? And Reed said, no, we've done the analysis. Our algorithms have analyzed the show and we already predict it's going to be a big success. In fact, we can even tell you who you should cast. And when you come to writing the script, our data engineers can provide some pointers about exactly what should happen when to make sure you engage our audience across the entire season when they're binge watching. This is extraordinary, isn't it? You see, the lesson of Netflix is not that they put television on a streaming platform. Rather, it's that they took the data from the streaming platform and used it to reinvent the way they made decisions about television. You're going to have this power as well, because as you start to get more data and feedback from the job you do or the team you run, you need to be asking yourself, how can I use this to make smarter decisions? In some ways, this is the secret power at Amazon. Amazon's secret power is not that they have invested massive amounts of money in drones or you know, AWS cloud services. It could be something as simple as the fact that they've banned PowerPoint. Now, why is Amazon banned PowerPoint? Now, I don't know how you feel about PowerPoint, but I've suffered too many times in meetings where I feel like it's hours of my life I'll never get back. You know those people who signpost your misery by putting the number of slides in the bottom right-hand corner. You walk into the room and it says 1 slash 300, and you, you literally know that this is 300 slides of your life you'll never get back. It's not easy. But what does Amazon do instead? Well, at Amazon, if you want to get a decision made, you've got to go in with a maximum six-page memo and a stack of data appendices. People spend the first 15 minutes of the meeting in silence, reading the memo. And then they go through point by point to see if the data supports the points and the points support the hypothesis and the hypothesis supports the ultimate goal of improving the customer experience. You see, at Amazon, the value of data isn't just about crafting better technological systems or selling more products to consumers. The value of data is that it lets you change the way you make decisions and the way you seize opportunities. Can you do that as well? So when I start to think about what really defines success in the algorithmic age, what it takes to be a 21st century organization, I think you can start to see it's much bigger than just technology. It's not about using the latest tools or devices. True transformation requires cultural change. Think about the impact of AI on the value that you bring to your role. Look closely at the relationship between automation and work. And as you start to see automation come in, don't see it as a threat. Realize it is an opportunity 
to do more interesting work. And then ask yourself, how can you on a daily basis use data to become a better decision maker? Here's the next action that I want you to think about. I want you to spend some time reflecting deeply about your own decision making and the decisions that you and your team make. Ask yourself, what are the kinds of activities today that are highly routine and repetitive where you should be absolutely looking more closely at automation? What are the kinds of areas where you think in the future AI and machine learning might use data to generate recommendations for you to get smarter at making decisions? But at the end of all of that, what do you think are going to be the human-shaped problems that are very strategic and very nuanced, where ultimately we should be spending more time on? The future of the company isn't about technology. It's about us. And creating a cultural operating system is our real challenge in the 21st century.